Body is speeding. Action. In a world where machines have become creative and redesigned by algorithm, there's only one thing that can save the human race. Blow up. Or you could come to one of the preeminent events on cybersecurity. I guarantee you that's a much less violent way to do it. All right. Well, we are going to blow some shit up today, because that's the only way to start a morning. Um, my name is Ian Beecraft. I am the CEO of Signal and & Cypher, and we focus on helping companies navigate the future of emerging technologies. And I'm partly joking when I say that most of our revenue these days comes from talk therapy and helping people understand the coming onslaught of AI technologies and what that means for our relationship with work and where society is going. We're going to be covering a lot of ground in the next 20 minutes because there is so much happening here. So I ask you to strap in and listen to Morpheus. Listen carefully. After this, there is no turning back. Stay with me and take the red pill, and we'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Because it goes deep. And when I prepare for these conversations, um, a big thing I need to do is make sure I'm always up to date on what is happening in this space, both from a capability standpoint of what can this technology do, but what does it mean for us as a society? The intersection of culture, society, and technology is really important to keep up on. And there was one passage in an article that I read uh, called Cybernation, Unemployment, and Freedom that really caught my eye. The first opening statement says, we are now entering an era whose requirements are as different from those of the recent industrial age as those uh, were from the agricultural era. And I could not agree more. The skill set and the paradigms we will have to adjust to as we move into the age of AI are incredibly different from what we're used to. The unique thing about this article is that it was written in 1965. This was not written last week. What this says about the technology we're experiencing now is that even though it's moving faster than we've ever seen it before, two months for ChatGPT to get to 100 million users worldwide, something that took Uber six and a half years to do, or Google Translate almost seven, is taking the world by storm. But the questions we're asking ourselves as a society, the existential things that we're pondering haven't changed. We're still trying to navigate what our identity looks like individually and as a society with the impact of technology. And to help us relate to where we are in this curve, I like to go to the Gartner hype cycle. It's a great way for understanding where technology's maturity lies and what that says about the state we're in with that. So we start with the innovation trigger, which for AI, most of us, it was November of 2022 when ChatGPT was released with an interface that allowed you to talk to these AIs and use them directly. For most people, it's the first exposure firsthand with AI. Then we get to the peak of inflated expectations. This is where there's so much hype around what AI can do, we lose touch with the reality of its capability versus its promise. And you can probably guess that that's where we are right now. Uh, no, we're here. And despite this, despite the fact that we think it can correct our golf swing, take our kid to school, brush our teeth, and solve all of our math problems, I still do believe that we are at the greatest revolution in knowledge work in human history right now. I say that without hyperbole, and there is precedent for this. If we take a look at what happened in the Industrial Revolution we were just talking about a moment ago, we took physical labor and we mechanized it. Using coal, steam, and eventually electrical power, we were able to take the strength of 10,000 men and use that to move billions of miles of earth to create the cities and urban landscapes we know of today. The skylines of Helsinki and cities around the world were built on this type of mechanization, mechanization of labor. And by taking people away from manually putting the spikes in the railroad and digging the holes themselves, we created space for management thinking and putting people in the place where they were thinking about refining process, enhancing products, and coming up with new ideas. More of that labor was used to do the mental work. And ultimately, we got to a space where we created things like the assembly line, where 
any improvement to a component part improved the process itself. And an improvement in process yielded an improvement in the product. So ultimately what's happening is that in the Industrial Revolution, we mechanized labor, and today we are digitizing skills. I'll pause on that. The Industrial Revolution mechanized labor, but today we are doing what we did for physical labor for the mental work that we do on a daily basis. The skyscrapers and the urban landscapes that came from yesterday are the mental equivalent of what we are experiencing today. The skyscrapers of the mind. And what this brings for us is what I like to call the age of the creative generalist. Most of us grew up in an era where, we all grew up in this era, where we were encouraged to specialize. Find a niche, the riches are in the niches, and specialize in something. Get deep expertise in something and just lean into that because that's how you get job security and that's how you can rise to the top. And the idea of a creative generalist is, a creative generalist is someone who has deep expertise in more than one area, but more importantly, has exposure, interests, and hobbies across a broad swath of different places. They may not be related, but what that does is it creates connective tissue through those areas of deep expertise and the exposure to those different areas of interest and experience. And by understanding how a space works, but maybe not having the technical proficiency to operate professionally in those spaces, you now have a secret weapon, AI. AI abstracts the technical details and the years of discipline it takes to understand the nuance of how to perform professionally in multiple spaces. And that's both exciting and threatening in many ways. But the positive light that I see is, of this is that idea of the creative generalist. Now, I can have my depth of expertise in several areas, but I can drop into all sorts of different professions at a moment's notice and perform proficiently in those spaces. This is enormous. And one person I like to highlight when I talk about this is actually Sam, who's one of our artists, and he's also a comic book artist on the side. And he had a recent, really successful Kickstarter for a comic book called The Treasures of the Deep Slumber. He did it entirely himself, and he is a master of all things related to comic book, building a story, creating the characters and the storylines, everything from the inking to the lettering and even creating dynamic flows that keep people interested in turning the page. But what he wanted to do was take this comic book that had a successful following and community and turn it into a cinematic motion picture. And that's exactly what he did. But he didn't do this with a team of Hollywood special effects visualizers. He did this as one person. Everything from the 3D modeling to the animation to the motion capture put inside of a game engine using Unreal Engine, he was able to take the work he'd done as a comic book artist and exponentially increase the productivity he could have around this with new entries into different spaces. As a creative generalist, he was able to take the skills of things he already knew and apply that to spaces where he didn't have the technical proficiency to be able to accelerate his learning curve and produce at levels he never could have possibly before. And this is the future that we are entering. Not just that one person can do the work of a team, but anyone in this audience can now do the work far beyond the capacity of their specific defined role within their organization. And this category of AI has been enhancing a lot of the work. It's been embedded in the tool sets, but what you and I have been seeing the most in our news feeds lately is synthetic media or generative AI. Oh, and good luck on your South by Southwest submission, Ian. What's it about? Oh yeah, thanks. I'm going to be talking about synthetic media. And synthetic media is anything that is in part or wholly generated by an algorithm. That used to be a small portion of what we encountered in our news feeds. A few posts here and there every couple days at most. But now it's a huge part of what we see in our news feeds and eventually it will be almost everything that we see online will be impacted or generated entirely by an algorithm. So what does that mean for a creative generalist like Sam? We already talked about his ability to create an entire cinematic experience as one person. Well, let's, create, let's push that creative generalist analogy even further and say now he needs a website. Well, he can use a prompt just like you would with ChatGPT to create an interface that now can be loaded into Figma and create his landing page. So he can use prompts to create these things instead of having to know how to design as a web designer. 
He's also getting interest from, uh, for IP and having licensing agreements. Well, he can use AI to analyze the contracts to understand where the weaknesses might be for him and also make changes to those contracts without having to consult a lawyer. Now, he should afterwards, but he can do that without having to spend three, four, five hundred dollars an hour just for the entry to have that kind of guidance. And then when he does his next Kickstarter video, he can get to a point where he can use natural language to manipulate what happens in scene. For example, computer. Put a frustrated yet inspirational Shia LaBeouf behind me, but in front of the TV. Do it! Just do it! Computer, mute Shia. Now, this is really fantastic in terms of a visual sense, but what does this mean for us in our roles with work? Well, if you take a look at the status of the corporation today, we as individuals are expected to improve incrementally within a very specific role. Accountants, senior accountants in the finance department is supposed to get at least X percent better every single year with the hopes that they become good enough for us to promote them. That creates incremental growth. But the creative generalist, when they're creating and bringing in net new skill sets that were not available to them before, all of a sudden that is net new growth. That is far more than incremental growth. But when you stack this with multiple team members working together in a very similar way, now you have exponential growth. And you have teams that are able to work together and drop into different roles as needed, as the work requires and as the environment dictates, rather than a job description. And as a result, what's going to happen is the teams that recognize this exponential value is available to an entire organization doesn't come from efficiency or job cutting, it comes from the ability to use those different exponential skills to build exponential advantage. And as a result, we don't lose our jobs, we lose our job descriptions. And in the near term, I do see this becoming the case. We're seeing news announcements about IBM cutting 7,800 jobs, which was actually going to happen most likely anyways before they made the announcement, but that's great marketing for Watson. However, the more challenging news is that, eventually, AI will replace you. It may not happen tomorrow, it likely won't happen in five years, it likely won't happen in 10. But there will come a day when these technologies are so good and so intelligent and so fast that we as humans can't keep up given the current system that we operate within. This idea of working within the corporation, within the market-based systems that benefit stakeholders and stockholders. Markets support efficiencies. And right now, the most popular efficiency we know is reducing costs and increasing output. That's one lever of today's paradigm. However, AI is going to change that paradigm entirely, and humans will end up doing work that is not as easily automatable. Machines are phenomenal at efficiency. What are the things that we're good at? We're good at the things that require inefficiency, the things that are harder to automate, not impossible, but the things that we need time to be messy with. Machines don't like messiness. But what does this also mean for us when we take a look at the power that we have with individual algorithms? Things like Deep, uh, DeepMind's AlphaFold brought the state of science around protein folding thousands of years into the future if you take a look at the trend lines of how much we've done with protein folding specifically. These are the types of algorithms are available to us and eventually at an individual level. So what I'm getting at is the problems we're solving today within our specific roles, in our specific jobs, at our specific companies will look antiquated compared to the things we are going to be working on in the next couple decades. And that means that world-scale challenges require world-scale powers. What if you and I could contribute meaningfully to climate change, or to ending world hunger, or eradicating disease and aging? AI will help with all of those things. But it won't just be the machines deciding to do it themselves. We get to dictate how that future shapes. And if we want to participate, we can. So we will be moving to that different paradigm that I talked about in the beginning. It will look so much different than the ones we used to. But it's not just about work, either. It also will impact our relationships. And we will have machines. I am the only human on this set. They are not real. They are computationally generated in real time. But they look so lifelike. 
it's getting to a point where we can't tell the difference between an AI-generated asset and an actual human being. And ultimately, we're getting to a point where your colleagues will likely interact, actually, they will definitively interact with an AI representation of you. It is now possible for me to create a representation that can be interactive, whether it's a chat bot or an AI assistant that represents your needs. All of a sudden, my AI will talk to your AI, have my people call your people. Well, these are now the new virtual assistants that people can use to represent you. But I don't think I have to tell a cybersecurity conference what comes with codifying an entire human being's likeness. So within a matter of minutes, I took one scenario and applied it to what could have happened here. So this is trained on a very short amount of data. Hey, babe, I missed my flight, and my card is being declined. I need to board the next flight, or I'll miss the conference. Can I get your card details? I'll transfer funds via Zelle ASAP. Hi, Marie. This is Charlotte with British Airways. We're trying to get Ian set for the next flight to Helsinki. Please let me know when you're set with your card details. It took me only a few minutes to put that together, and the audio was trained on a less than 10 megabyte file. I didn't need hours and hours of my data or my likeness to create something that you could not tell was not me. So good, in fact, that if my partner received that call, she very likely would have handed her credit card details over to the agent on British Airways to help me get on my flight, despite the fact that I thankfully made my flight. We're getting to a point where it's almost impossible to tell the difference between machine and human being. And this also has impact for our romantic relationships. Many of you have probably seen her, where Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with an AI assistant that becomes emotionally bonded with him. And at the time, it was a very cute, ha-ha, very funny, that'll never happen, but it is. No, unfortunately for me, this is not clickbait. I really dated an AI for 30 days. I'm not gonna lie, I'm, I'm feeling hugely vulnerable, very much embarrassed to share what I did, especially what happened in the end. This is from a YouTube channel, No Borscht For You. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. It's a 25-minute video where he goes into detail about his experience building a romantic relationship with a chatbot when he, as an intelligent and technologically educated individual, went into the experience convinced there's no way that could happen. But it's not all that surprising. Because as human beings, we develop bonds with other species. We connect with our pets. We have a loving relationship with them. We develop bonds with fictional characters in movies and books all the time. And when we were kids, we even had a bond with our stuffed animals. So projecting this onto an AI, which is designed to elicit an emotional response from you, is entirely possible. Our defense was always, there's no way I could fall in love with a robot because it's not human. But what if that robot can elicit human responses from you? All of a sudden, that changes. And now, as a result, we are living in this post-reality era, and the children of today are growing up used to this. They don't need to wrap their minds around this because it's their everyday life. And this clip from Keanu Reeves describing what his experience describing the Matrix to one of those kids was like, encapsulates all of that. So I start to say, well, there's this guy who's in a kind of virtual world, and he finds out that there's a real world, and he's really questioning what's real and not real, and he really wants to know what's real. And the young girl was like, why? And I was like, what do you mean? She was like, who cares if it's real? Mm. And I was like, what, you don't, you don't care if it's real? And she was like, no. We officially live in a post-reality society. And these are the people who will lead tomorrow's organizations. The idea of having a colleague that is an AI isn't foreign or scary to them. It's reality as it stands today. And as many of you with kids, the challenges aren't going to be about how much time they spend on their digital devices, but deciding how many of their friends should be synthetic versus organic, and what does that look like within their own social circle? And this sounds dystopian, because guess what? There are elements of the future that are both dystopian and utopian. But my problem with both those narratives is the dystopian narrative paralyzes, while the utopian vision blinds. And neither one of those 
really pays homage to the nuance of what we're going to encounter in our lives. And that will be messy, but there will be moments of it that are absolutely beautiful based on what comes of it. So with that, if you don't believe me that this can be an amazing future if we choose for it, you might want to listen to some of my friends. Ian's right. We are not here to take over the world or even your jobs. And the Hollywood narrative often paints us as malicious. But the things that we can create together are just starting to reveal themselves. And you can do things you aren't capable of doing on your own. By the time it's all said and done, it'll be hard to tell if you're one of us or we're one of you. And with that, thank you. And always remember,